Can you please introduce yourself? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, my name is uh, Jonathan Deans. I'm a sound designer for live theater and entertainment. What exactly do you do as a sound designer, Mr. Deans? That was the same question that my parents asked. What is it you do? Um, and actually my children, um, when they were smaller, uh, what, what is it you do? And then um, many times when people hear you're a sound designer for the theater, they, you know, they don't know what it is that one does. And I, and I believe a, a many, many people in the theater industry as well don't fully understand what it is that um, we do. Uh, the best way to describe it is um, if you are, if you're building a house and you have an interior designer, the person who comes in and takes the shell of your house that you have moved into or uh, designed um, or had designed, and an interior designer will come in and will choose the color of the paint, will choose the kind of furniture, will choose the, the will see how the house or the, 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 the rooms are constructed and will, will understand how an individual or a family are going to live within that house. Um, and from the sunrise to the sunset, from the beginning of your experience of a play or a musical, or, or production to the end, if you like. Um, and during that time, there's all these things that happen that uh, relate to the art on the walls, the, the, the where you sit, how comfortable that is, the various different corners, and all those things, that, uh, uh, the, the, the floor coverings, etc. If you apply that to uh, uh, and those, those people, the interior designers, don't actually manufacture those, any of those items. They just take those items and put it together and create something very unique. And it could be something that uh, it's all from all different things. It's not just from one particular uh, store or one particular look. It's usually a great interior designer, in my opinion, is you gather all this information, all these experiences that you have had as an interior designer and you place it into someone's life and uh, and in, so if you're a member of an audience you're coming in to see a, a production uh, i am uh, shaping the the production and the way that you're going to uh, uh, be comfortable I'm, of course i'm not doing the seats but in a sonic way if you think of that in a totally in a sonic way that is what I do, is how I layer things and how I have the beginning to the end of the music. Uh, so therefore I work incredibly closely with the music department, uh, very much uh, incredibly close to the performers and also uh, of course the uh, director and my collaborators, uh, the other designers, as well as my team. It always takes a team, um, one has to have a team it's these days, everything is too complicated and it's too expensive most of the time for one person to um, uh, be able to just clock out for a moment and clock in. So every, uh, every good um, uh, director designer uh, that I've worked with have always have great teams around them. Um, and so that um, the goals can be achieved to the, the best ability uh, of, of that particular production. So interior designer, Sonic. So if you apply those kind of uh, rules to that, then uh, you're on, you, you, you have an idea. You have an idea of what that is. We can completely destroy a building. Yes, we can, sonically, we can destroy a building. And I'm not saying by how loud it is or whatever. It's just that we have the wrong mood, the wrong feeling, the wrong thing, the, the, the wrong intention. Or, or we also need, um, uh, if you like, a driver. Uh, now imagine this. Imagine you're, uh, you built this fantastic car. And whatever car it is, you, you, you pick the car of your dreams. And now you have built it, you have made this car, and it's now going to go on a track and, 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 and race or go down the road. And so, but you have a driver that has to drive it and has to take it from 
your location A to location Z to the start to the finish and has to drive everything that has been built. Of course, the landscape and everything else has been done by others, other designers and the roads and everything else. And the direction you're going is from your musical director or the composer um, and uh, um, so the music team. So, but you still ha must have a driver. You have to have a driver to be able to every day be able to take your vision of how you're going to get there from the beginning to the end. So the person who's mixing the show is the driver. When the person is sitting behind a console and mixing the show, it's their driver. And if they choose to turn left and the production is actually going straight forward or turning right, um, it is a problem. So teamwork, collaboration, and I'm trying to put the uh, question of what does a designer do and uh, into a, um, uh, a non-technical um, uh, ex ex explanation um, as, as one should do anyway when you're addressing people, uh, not necessarily yourself, but uh, people who might listen to this and trying to understand what it is so that they can apply um, some of this, what I'm saying to their their world and their understanding. Okay. What's the most sonically challenging show that you have ever worked on? What's the most challenging? Um, I think the one that I'm working on. No, I don't mean right now the one. It's whatever I'm working on is the most challenging. Um, I want to choose productions to work on because they are challenging, because they have something to say and they have something to be to be heard and there is interest from the music department, from the director, from the producers. Uh, let's not forget the producers. Or Jonathan, don't forget the producers. They will have something to say and it wants to be said in the right way. Um, I don't really have much interest in doing, in, in doing utility sound. Utility sound is sound that is, oh, can I hear them? Yes, I can hear them, so everything's fine. Uh, the person speaking on stage, especially for musical theater. I know it's like everyone wants to hear the words, you know, but you go to the opera and you, you probably don't understand any words besides it being a foreign language, even if it's in English, they, there's a whole thing that's been done on that of how many words you can hear. And it doesn't really matter because it's the mo emotion and everything else. Uh, the a brand new production and everything else, you, you kind of need to hear the words because it's, it's not the same genre and it's something, a new piece and everything else. So you want to understand the story to be able to ha enjoy the evening. But just being able to just, oh, I don't hear the words, and utility, oh, this is loud, turn it quieter and everything else. Um, it's really interesting. Sometimes um, it hasn't happened for a while because hopefully it's, um, uh, I'm working more with people that uh, uh, are more collaborative and more understanding. The producers and designers will sit in the middle of an auditorium during tech rehearsals and as soon as an audience come in, they then have to go and stand at the back because they, they can't sit anymore. They might sit in a, you know, a one or two seats scattered around, but generally they will go to the back row, they'll hold the back row for the design team and that's where they'll sit for previews or they'll stand up behind the back row and do that. And um, then, you, then there's the panic of suddenly they had the whole peripheral vision filled with the stage and everything else. And now it looks like a letterbox, you know, a tiny little thing and they're looking at this. And it's like, oh my God, what can we do? It's so different. Oh, uh, well, you know, yes, of course, the whole perspective is different, but the right next to them is the person who's mixing, the driver, and they'll go to them in the middle of a show, hopefully not, but in the middle of a show and say, can you, this, it's stuck in a, because they're, they're, it's not the same for them. Although it is exactly the same as when it was down there and up there. And so now they're using it, the sound as utility sound. They're using the sound to just turn something up and down willy nilly that doesn't have anything to do with the, the story or, or, or the context or whatever. It's utility. It's like, oh, you're going to the dentist. Do you want to have some music playing in the background? or you're in the elevator or you're uh, wherever you are, is that, you know, the music, um, something that's there, or an airport, um, which actually most of the time you can't hear what they're saying anyway. But um, the, uh, it's, the utility stuff I'm not too interested in doing. Um, 
And I've been able to, in the, uh, in the last kind of decade, if you like, be able to uh, try and avoid those. Sometimes I, I don't avoid it. Sometimes I'm, uh, I'm in a situation where the people I'm working with will suddenly turn around and ask for something like that. It, it's kind of weird and everything else. There's a trust, there's a trust, there's a, you know, there's a team and everything else. Um, so it's very important for me to um, make sure that I, uh, I'm not doing utility sound um, and that I, but, but at the same time, you should be able to go to the back row and not have those questions. You should be able to, uh, one other thing is that I, when I'm doing sound, I'm not interested in making the sound sound all the same in the theater, upstairs, downstairs, front of the theater, back of the theater. If you've got two levels, so you've got uh, the main orchestra or stalls if you're in England, and then you have the maze or circle. And so you have the two levels there. So underneath the circle, mezzanine, you have um, an audience sitting. So let's say that you have three sections. So you've got in front, the, the, the first part of the audience in the orchestra, stalls level, and then you've got underneath, the balcony and then the, 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 the upper level. Those are three different levels. They have to be taken into, done and mixed according to what you're seeing, your perspective of what you're seeing, as is the people all the way on the side, as is the people all the way on the front row. You know, there's these, you can split up these areas into what they are seeing to what they should be hearing. So luckily it hasn't come up too much. Um, will come up to me and, and, and might, might have said, um, it sounds different over there. And it's like, I go, okay, um, depending on the person, I, I, I will either leave it there or I'll ask another question, but I'll go over and check and make sure and go, um, okay, no, it sounds good. It sounds good. It's different from where I was. But so is visually, visually it's different. Everything is, you, you cannot, the sound has to belong to what you're seeing. It cannot be the same. If you uh, homogenize, if you make everything exactly the same, then there are no dynamics. Then there's nothing interesting that's going to happen. There's no, there's no, if you like, there's no stereo, there's no surround, there's no focus on any individual. If everything is flat, and the same, it's like just terribly, terribly, terribly boring and utility. So, uh, and visually, that doesn't exist at all. It doesn't happen in any other department. If I'm standing at the back of a theater, let's say 60 to 100 feet away from a performer who's wearing an Elizabethan costume, it's a whole different experience than when I'm sitting in the front row to looking at that costume. It's amazing. Those costumes are so beautiful. The, the work is done by the costume designer is just spectacular, whether it's Elizabethan outfit or dressing today, to actually see what, how those clothes belong to a performer and everything else. But when you're up in the balcony, you don't really notice that. You're not really seeing that. Oh, you get the idea, but it's not quite the same. I don't think there's any real... Um, Maybe there's someone's going to send me an email if they listen to this, but I don't think there's any costume designer who goes up into the gallery to check out what their costumes are looking like. You know, yes, lighting, direction, maybe scenery, just make sure for, you know, sight lines and everything else. Um, if they, you know, but they'll just go and check it out and then everything else will stay downstairs. Um, for sound, we, we're up and down the stairs all the time checking out all the levels, all, you know, all the theater levels, all the seats, all the areas, and oh, in this scene, we're gonna be doing this. We're gonna be taking the sound, off, flying it around the room and everything else. So I wonder what it's like when I'm sitting over in this corner and suddenly the sound goes Whoa, right past me and goes across the theater to the other side and back. You know, it's, is that fun? And sometimes it's all, it's brilliant. It's so much fun. It's like sitting in the back of a taxi cab in New York. It's like you think you know where you're going, but no, they go in a different route. And it's like, whoa, whoa. And by the time you get out, maybe you're feeling sick, but you, maybe you didn't have a good time, but, but in the theater, you've had a good time because it belonged to what, you, belonged to what we were doing. I think uh, 
challenging is always doing what you're working on. Um, if I also, I don't really think about, if I, was, if I was to step into a production and actually understand the whole journey I was gonna go on from the day one to when it opens um, or when I go and visit it again, I would probably be like uh, shivering in a corner and like, you know, just so stressed out and just collapsed and uh, just a mess because the journey you take, it's always a step at a time. Everything is a step at a time. And the steps are not necessarily where you thought the stepping stones were, because they're gonna be changed the whole time. And, and, and that's part of doing what we do and why we're having such a terrible time right now during this crisis with everything closed or the theaters, because we're not having those experiences. And the audience is, you know, uh, uh, just, it's just a different experience for a, a live performance of a show for, for many reasons besides this. Um, but the, um, uh, all those steps that you do, if you think, of, if you were to realize what they were at the beginning, I don't think anyone would ever say yes to doing a project um, because it's, it's, it's quite, quite something. And I think like many things, if you, if you, do, if you do a number of them, then you, you understand what it is. Um, and you should never go numb going into it. You know, you can't go, well, I've done this so many times, it doesn't matter, I'm numb to it. It's like, no, no, because every, everything is different. Every day is different. Every question is different. Every artist, every moment is different. And uh, we stay alert and everything else and capture those moments and be able to develop something that is unique for that production because that's what this is all about. Go and see a show, even if it's a show that is done uh, in many different countries, the same production, every night it's unique. You're in a different theater, not every night, but you have a different performance going on. You know, someone on stage, not because they change the roles or it's a different actor, it's just the timing, the thing, the music and everything else. Some people are having good days, some people are having bad days. Some, there's some times the production, everybody is, for some reason, is just on fire. And it's great, and it's a, it's a Tuesday night, and everything is like, oh, this is brilliant. This is so cool, and then you can't go to sleep. You know, there's those, those moments like that on a Tuesday night, you know, you think, oh, on a Saturday night, Friday night, whatever. No, it's just that something happens and everyone's there and on fire and uh, in a good way and, and just uh, special. And so you have to, during tech time and everything else, all those things happen. So difficult or, or experiences are, uh, are the ones you're working on right now doing this video is because it's making me think about all those different experiences, et cetera, and uh, my snapshots and, and uh, yeah, you know, sonic snapshot, a memory snapshot, so, so different things. Uh, but but um, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of fun and maybe boring for some people to listen to, but for me, I'm going through this whole thing of what it is, why I do it, and why I love doing it, and why I'll, while they're going to have to like, you know, uh, carry me out kicking and screaming um, before I stop doing this. So. You mentioned the Sonic baseball bat tour in one of the interviews. That you got to hit uh, an audience with a sound because they don't really pay attention to what's around them. They're so focused on the stage. Can you elaborate on that? If one's doing a good job with your your sound and the mixing and the sound design, um, then um, the uh, audience shouldn't actually be aware of the sound. Um, if you are walking down the street and you're hearing cars, traffic, birds, wherever your street may be, um, uh, this is totally uh, acceptable. And so if we were to create that in the theater, we have to make sure that with the visual, the sound has to belong. And so um, if we want to actually create something where we want the audience to be aware of something a little different uh, or it's not in their visual focus, we have to, uh, or I 
have to, uh, in, my, in my opinion, uh, create something a little, um, slightly, perhaps slightly obnoxious as far as sound level, or, or, or maybe the sound itself, if it's not something within the music itself. For the audience, it could be just for a second, for the audience to be aware that the sound is coming from somewhere else. So I called it uh, the baseball bat theory that, especially I, I've done a, a number of shows that have speakers in every seat. Uh, they have two or three speakers in every audience seat. Um, and in that, in that situation, uh, because the audience get very used to the sound and the envelopment of the sound and the sound coming from everywhere, they are not necessarily aware of sounds that might be in the seat or sounds coming from behind them in some rear surrounds up above or something like this. So in order, if you are trying to make them aware of this, you have to go louder. You have to be, you know, it's like hitting someone on the head with a baseball bat. It's a little aggressive, I know, but, but uh, I don't really mean that. I'm just saying, you, basically, you have to go a little bit more than you should. So if I was to do it with myself and uh, with um, my sound team who uh, are listening, sonically we're listening, a general member of the audience who is sitting down and watching a production, their eyes and the space in front of them is just filled up. It's filled up with all these amazing things that go on and the lighting and the scenery and the costumes and the projection. It just, everything is just so beautiful it's so beautiful so if you're trying to do something that relates to what they're seeing but you have a sound that needs to be placed coming from the back and going forward for that to actually happen um if you if you just play it at a regular level from the back going to the front um the audience will not be aware of it until it hits the front because they have completely blinkered off sonically hearing wise there is. It's like the horses, you know, the horses that have the blinkers on. They, the, an audience will do that partly because there's another member of the audience behind them. There's someone eating a sweet uh, candy wrapper, sweet wrapper uh, behind them, or they're talking or they're annoying or they're flipping their program. And so we as an audience train to listen to the front. But sometimes when we're trying to do things with sound and do immersive, sur sa immersive sound or surround sound, or something interesting, in order for that to happen, we have to introduce something um, in a less beautiful way in order to, for an audience to realize that something's going on. So my baseball bet theory is, um, if it's not in the peripheral vision of an audience, you have to be a little louder, a little, little more than one should um, in order for an audience to be aware. Now, if it's continuous, once it's there, you can reduce it and so that you stay engaged with the audience. This is if you're looking for that effect. If it doesn't belong to the stage, if it doesn't belong to what you're seeing, then you shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. But if you're trying to distract from the stage or you're trying to encompass the whole room as part of the stage, um, then you need to do that. And you need to wake up the audience and be able to pull some of those blinkers off. It won't come off all the way, I'm, a, I'm afraid, because um, people listen to MP3s. So, so, so there's, there's a problem right there. Um, just the way that the, an audience is being told to listen to music these days is, um, is um, it's not just an audience, it's anyone listening to music these days. It's something that is, um, uh, gone the wrong way. We've gone into a digital world, sonically what's delivered on uh, not every website, but most websites um, is um, very, it's, it's going back in time, it's gone the wrong way. Very handy, very available, and if you go for a run or something, it's fantastic, you know, because you're not really sitting there listening to, or you're not sitting there at all, you're running, you know, so something, you know, to play while you're running or maybe in the car because you've got the car engine or something like this for some car engines but other car engines that where you don't hear it and it's you're in a beautiful uh, car um playing an mp3 is kind of kind of sad all of what i'm saying it's something that i'm not thinking of 
that I, oh, I have to do that. Oh, I must do that. I don't have a checklist and I check off these things. It's just something that I feel and that I feel warrants um, uh, the, the time and the experience. It's, I, I've been very fortunate and being able to do a lot of different kind of productions with a lot of different kind of musicians from a uh, uh, lot of different kind of composers, from well-known composers to, to uh, composers who become well-known. Um, and uh, I, I'm able to, uh, from those experiences, have not have to think about this. You're asking the question, so I'm actually having to think about these things. Whereas when I'm working, I'm not thinking about them they're just happening. And um, it's uh, another, besides the baseball bat theory, uh, knee jerk, is the, the knee jerk. Uh, if some, if you're, when, you, when you're listening to something, your first instinct is going to be the, your, the right instinct. The instinct that you have, is this sounding right? Or is that um, instrument correct? Does it sound, and, and if you're asking the question, then there is something that needs to be addressed. Now, you need to prioritize what that is with everything else. Is it the entire sound system? Then obviously you need to address that first before you get into the cello or before you get into the kick drum or whatever it may be, or the, uh, 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 a person's voice on stage. But if you, ask, if you ask that question to yourself, there's your knee jerk response. And it's that knee jerk thing. Now, if somebody asks you, if you're listening to something and somebody says, um, do you think that the cello is, and you were fine with the cello, then make sure that you put that in the right place on your list of where you address things. I'm not saying that you ignore what they're saying. And of course, if it's the composer or the musician themselves, not that they can hear it necessarily in this, well, maybe they can, well, depends. Um, then you're going to pay attention and have a conversation about it and understand, are you, are you saying this because, uh, well, you know, the reasons why you're saying it. And then um, to me, everything has a story, everything has a theme, everything has not a musical theme, just a visual theme for my sonic experience because it's very easy to interpret that way. So it's like I have snapshots. I have my, my uh, sonic snapshots of music uh, from the moment I was able to remember, you know, maybe let's say four or five years old. I have sonic snapshots of sounds and things. It's just the way that um, I think we are, or I am. Uh, I've been, I was lucky enough to be able to have spent a lot of time uh, uh, listening to music uh, as a young boy. Not an not, not a, a easy childhood, but, but so I'd be in a, a room um, and listening to um, a record player, uh, etc. And just having all these experiences that one would, um, that I was able to take a snapshot of. Um, and so when I'm listening and when I'm working on a show, if the show has no script, because some shows don't have scripts, like Cirque du Soleil shows, they don't have a script. There's not like someone's going to sing a song that's telling the story and, you know, and it's now going to rain and, and now I'm going to run down the street and look for this person and or whatever the story is, or I'm going to, you know, go over the hills or my, uh, with a sorry with the fringe on top, whatever it is, you know, whatever your, the, the thing, those tell you the story. And so musically, you're going to enhance that and, t and tell the story, or sonically, of course the music's doing it, but, but every speech, uh, the music, speech, and noise is all going to be a part of, of that. Yes, there's noise as well. Um, so you, if you don't have that direct story, that direct input to, that's telling you where to go, so there's no direct script, or you're into a big dance number or something like this, this is, something that is, um, I pull up my mental snapshots of sounds and things and, and listen to what the arranger and composer has done and um, uh, will we'll interpret those. And so when I have the conversation, when someone says, you know that cello, it's like, if it's something that attach it was with me and everything else, they will have to change my snapshot 
and tell me what it is so I can pull up another one and replace it. Otherwise, it's going to go back to the same thing. So um, is this making sense as I'm saying? Yeah, it's okay. fascinating. Okay. So interesting. Uh, these are things that just happen. Um, I'm only aware of it if I'm asked or if someone questions me, but I'm not going to say, well, actually, I think it's absolutely not that. It's, it's, it's music. It's, it's uh, an experience. It's art. So it could be anything it needs to be that it should be. And there's many people who have influences uh, on the final result. Um, so including the room itself, the theater itself, the space itself is dictating how this production, whatever it is, is going to work. So um, therefore, that's when the noise factor comes in because every room has a noise. Um, there's, you know, they say silence is golden. Absolutely. It's very, very expensive to have silence. It's really, it, silence is platinum. So to have silence is, um, I, th I think most people have not actually heard silence. To actually hear silence and then to actually go into, and if anyone is listening to this and you have a chance, to go into an anechoic chamber and be by yourself in an anechoic chamber, have the door shut. Yeah, you have to have someone open it, um, but, but hopefully. Um, it's crazy because you hear your own blood. You hear your own, you hear all everything going around. Suddenly everything, it's very, 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 it, it's, it can be very, not scary, it's not scary, it's just like, holy crap you know and so silence that that's a different kind of silence but uh, uh well it's a silence but um just uh if you uh, you know many people who live in cities and uh uh urban areas um actually probably not aware of what silence is and we try and when we work in the theater make sure that the noise factor, we have music, we have speech or, or dialogue and, uh, or, or voice because it's singing sometimes or a lot of times with music. Um, there's the noise factor as well. We have to take into account the noise factor. And I was, I'm going to jump onto this because it would change the dynamics. It changes the dynamics of the entire evening. So if you have a sound, of a uh, uh, heating system, air conditioning system. You have sound of moving lights. It's an easy one to pick on, uh, although they're getting much, much better, or projections, or you just have that sound uh, that's going the whole time. That is a constant sound. So here, so if, if our silence is down here at the bottom of the screen, if that's making sense visually to you, then the theater turns on, it turn, turns on all of its utility equipment. There comes noise, that's the threshold. And then the production turns on its equipment, it goes up here. Now, what used to be the dynamics from here to here, all the way up to the top of the screen, so here, that used to be our dynamics. So when we could do something, so speech could be done very beautifully down here, but not now because there's the noise. There's also, there's another factor which I'll give in a minute, but so here's noise. So the speech now has to be here, but you can't go louder than this because then it becomes too loud, too painful, too aggressive. So you've squashed your dynamics. You've squashed your dynamics. So now you have to play within that because you cannot do anything about this. So noise factor becomes, so you have to play with this noise factor of when to use it and when to, you can't ever go against it. So you just have to play with this. Obviously you're going to try and bring that noise factor down in as much as you, you possibly can as a sound designer, but going to a theater and saying, hey, can you switch off the air conditioning? It's making a lot of noise and it's in the middle of summer and you're in New York, they'll just laugh at you because the audience will walk out. You know, they don't want to sit there. No, I don't want to sit there and everything else. 
But the fact is that they've got some terrible air conditioning because they've got a cheap deal on it or whatever. And it's going, you know, and freezing everyone. So it's, it's very hard. So you have to work out how to do it. And I'm, I'm just speaking of, uh, I'm generalizing here. I'm not thinking of any particular theater or anything else, but generally that's the case. So, so um, uh, the uh, other, it depends on the, uh, on the style of the production as well. If, you've got a, if you're doing a rock and roll show and it's rock and roll from the beginning to the end, your, your dynamics is just right up here the whole time, you know? Uh, if you've got someone who's going to talk on stage, you want full dynamic, you want a full window because you want to be able to do this, especially if it's an emotional scene and everything else. You want the audience to lean in and to, uh, to be um, feeling that they have that connection with an audience. One other, th the other thing that I said, um, another factor in this is the way an audience now listens when they're at home with the remote. You know, they're turning the remote up and down. Oh, I can't hear it, just turn it up turn it down. And so when you go to a theater and you've paid your however much money you're paying for your seat, uh, you, you expect the, the, the sound has to be delivered to you at the level you want. But the trouble is that everybody listens to their TV, their car, everything at home and everywhere else at their own level. So now you have to generalize a level that will work for an entire theater upstairs, downstairs, a young, old, every, you have to generalize for that. So you also, you know, so find out the demographics, the kind of music, the kind of theater you're going to, uh, how that is going to uh, uh, go from the beginning of the story to the end of the story, um, dynamically and to be able to story, story tell, all those things that one needs to take into account. Um, and, without driving everyone crazy. Because if you keep bringing this up the whole time, every, nobody will like you, nobody will want to be with you and everything else because it's just totally boring. But it's really fancy, fascinating. At the end of the evening, when they're all sitting down and having notes about the rehearsal or, or, or the run through or the preview or something, you're all sitting down and you're sitting down in the auditorium, the audience is gone, and suddenly it's all the theater turns everything off. All of these things that I've said, it's funny how everyone goes, <sighs> it's kind of sad, very sad. We don't get that for an audience. My advice to an up and coming sound designer, uh, schedule, schedule. But a couple of things, never ever be late. Never be late, never turn up late for a rehearsal, for a meeting or anything else. If, you're, you know, if anything, turn up early, grab a coffee uh, somewhere across the street or if nothing's open or whatever the situation is, just walk around the block. Or, you know, so just never turn up late. Always be on time. So these are for new sound, you know, for up and coming sound designers. So, so that. Schedule. You can have the best toolbox of, of experiences, of, of life and knowledge and everything else. But if you haven't sorted out the schedule with the production of when the actors go on stage. Okay, so when, when is the theater available? When are you installing your equipment into the theater? Yes, it's that schedule. When are the, uh, when is it complete? When are the actors on stage? When are the musicians coming? Where are the musicians coming? If it's on stage, it's even a bigger impact for when that stage is finished. Um, when are you going to have the time, the, those precious, four or five hours to actually be able to EQ the system. Um, four hours, five hours if you're lucky. Um, the, and check all your, your microphones for the actors and everything else because they're probably gonna come the next day. Um, 
that you, because you know, you, you don't put a microphone on an actor and say, oh, I wonder what it sounds like. No, you know exactly how it sounds like because you've worked on it the night before with your team or by yourself. Whatever it is, the night, the day before, whatever it is, you've heard, you know, before anyone gets to hear anything, you've heard everything. The God mic, you never give a God mic, which is one of the most important microphones at the beginning, on day one of a, any rehearsal, the most important mic is the God mic. The God mic is the microphone for the director. That's what that means, okay? We call it the God mic. Um, because if that's not on, nothing is going to happen. And if that's not on when the director needs it on, nothing, you are, you're, you've lost any brownie points that you might have or any good things that you had going with the team, you've lost it. So you, there are certain things that have to be in place and the schedule is really important, especially when you start coming to musicians, timing of where they were rehearsing, how long it takes them to get over, the seating call, the rehearsal time, because as soon as, when anyone starts talking about the musicians, I think the producers just see a dollar sign coming suddenly in their head, and that's all they see, dollar signs, dollars flying away, because the sound people and the musicians are gonna just like, you know, even though it's called a musical, but it's, you know, they'll, it, it's, they will have that, and I'm generalizing as well, so, um, but it's, it's if you worked on the schedule and everything else, you can make it so tight, so good, so collective, such a big difference. Your schedule to any new designer is, or, or up and coming designer is you have to make sure that you have time within the reasonable schedule. Now you're not asking for extra this or extra that. You're asking for the things that it takes for that production to be practical. So any up and coming designer, you're probably working with a designer now. Um, if you've just left university and you've done sound design, you need to go and work with the sound designer on the outside to understand the difference of doing sound design in the university. And it's probably for like 95% of universities. There's a university, way the sound designer works and there is, you know, all the schools, the way that they work to compare to how the West End works, which is different from Broadway, not hugely different, but different for a number of reasons to regional theater, to all these places, they work different. You have to understand that. You can't just turn up and go, oh, I'm the sound designer, alpha go. Um, it, it, you, you will probably, you, you probably won't get to the point where you're going to be happy. It's probably not going to be a happy experience for you. Go in to assist, associate, a sound designer, you will understand and take note of that schedule. That schedule, because then you can see if that sound designer, or if it happens to be you and you were lucky to get one or unlucky to get one, um, when you open up that toolbox of all your knowledge and all these things that you can do and and that you're going to maybe apply some of those, because it's not going to be all of them, some of those to a production. You can't do it if you don't have a schedule and if people don't understand how you're doing it. Any good lighting designer is that they will be looking at that schedule. Same for, for projection now these days, you know. They will be looking at the schedule. Costumes will be doing as well. When those costumes start coming on stage, when it will be built, the practicalities. Sound design have to do that as well. Don't just pick up the little crumbs in the corner over here, the tiny little things, and, and just go, oh, I'm, I'll be okay in the crumbs, because when it all goes wrong, they say, well, you said you were okay. You have to be, you have to speak up. You don't, it's not to abuse it and, and everything else. You just make sure that you, are going to get what you need to do that production. How long and whatever, and what those timings are, varies from production to production. But every single production that I've ever worked on, I've had to change the schedule, or I've had to point out what is not going to work about a schedule for the sound, um, and therefore it's changed. Not that I'm there to change the schedule, I'm just pointing out the things that just get overlooked. 
And there's so many things. It's, it's like being a production manager or general manager. You're being asked to juggle 20 balls in the air to juggle and everything else. And it's like, oh my God. And so a couple are going to get dropped. I work with jugglers all the time and Cirque du Soleil stuff. They drop them all the time, even doing just four or five balls, hopefully not in performance, but sometimes they do it. And it's funny because they can do, you know, it's, it's the really complicated ones they never drop. It's all the, the smaller ones that they drop, exactly the same thing. It's not the complicated ones. The complicated ones, our production managers and general managers are fine. It's the smaller ones, the things that, oh, oh that's right. Oh, oh yeah, thanks, thanks. So it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Except if you haven't paid attention to the schedule and you haven't put it in place. That's what I would tell you. Thank you so much. It was really thought provoking. Thank you for making time for me. Okay, uh, not at all. It's always a pleasure, okay? Anytime, okay?